Nearman Condition, the home of Collected oh, Edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for my overview of the Green Lantern Core by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason. Omnibus Volume 1 from DC Comics. So let's go ahead and get started. The day has finally come. It is actually here, and it does exist. Years in the making. I remember Peter Tomasi talking about this book coming out. Oh my gosh, it had to have been seven years ago, if not longer. But it's finally here in a volume one. And I'll just go ahead and mention that this does not collect everything that the solicits said it would. Um, I went ahead and read it cover to cover just because I love this series so much. Uh, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, mainly checking out the back of the book here. The spine of the book, Green Lantern Core by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Leeson. And as a matter of fact, let's do this. Let's go ahead and put these books together. I was kind of hoping they would give it the Peter Tomasi treatment on the spine. Um, but this is their first work together. Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason working together on this. And then they went over here and then here and then here. Uh, but I was hoping that it would have that spine. But let's see how it stands right beside the Jeff Johns Green Lantern Omnibus Volume 3. And honestly, yeah, it's got the same kind of design here. Wish this font was a little bit bigger to kind of match this. Uh, the DC logo, of course, has changed, but I think the latest printing of these Omnis have the new DC logo. But this is the way they're going to look together if you keep them together on your shelf. We're also going to be talking about the double dipping that it does with Volume 1 of the Green Lantern. And, of course, talk a little bit about what's uh, missing from this book that was solicited and what I was hoping they would add uh, that in case you're still wanting to read all of Green Lantern in chronological order. All right, let's look. By the way, when I talked to Patrick, or I'm sorry, Peter Tomasi, he was talking about how much he wanted Patrick Gleason to come back and draw a new cover, kind of like his covers to Batman and Robin or the Superman Rebirth. Here's what the flaps look like. Uh, but because Patrick Gleason is under contract at Marvel Comics, there was just no way that was going to happen. Underneath the dust jacket, we have our characters here. And some of these characters are old, and I'll go through uh, these characters here in a little bit. But you have Stell, one of my favorites right there. And then the spine, which is practically the same spine that's on the dust jacket. And then the back of the book right here. Art on board, and the omnibus itself has like a really shiny, glossy finish to it. All right, we're going to crack this book open, talk about when these stories take place. And show off this beautiful artwork. I, I'm going to try to stay away from big spoilers. I mean, I'm sure most of you know that the Sinestro Core Wars collected in here. Um, but I'm going to talk about a couple of things that lead into that. And of course, show off the artwork uh, without going too much into spoilers. All right. Let's get this opened. All right. Let's go ahead and get this book open. We have some black end sheets here. Green Lantern Core by Peter J. Tomasi and Patrick Gleason, Omnibus Volume 1. Here are your credits. Uh, written by Peter J. Tomasi, Jeff Jones, Dave Givens, Keith Champagne, Sterling Gates. And then your pencilers down here. Patrick Gleason, Pascal Alixe, Scott Eaton, Jamal Eigel, Carlos Magno, just to name a few. And then your inkers down here, like Prentice Rollins and Christian Alami, Rebecca Buckman. And those are just a few of the inkers. Your colorist, Moose Ballman. Guy Major, Randy Mayer, and letters, Phil Balsman, Steve Wands, and the other folks that help with those particular tasks, your table of contents. And this is what it collects. It tells you the cover artist, but it doesn't tell you who worked on what. It just tells you the release date. And it's interesting how this is collected because I think this is a really great collection and the way that this is mapped. A lot of thought was put into this. Uh, there are a couple of things that were collected in here that made me kind of scratch my head, though, because I was wondering why they added it at a particular time. And 
we do have the Exit to Eden story, which is really cool to have that collected in here. And we'll go through those and what those are exactly here in a little bit. Uh, but there's a couple of stories that doesn't um, that take place later on in the untold tales of the Blackest Night that I was wondering. I wonder why they decided to do it now and not with the next volume. But that's neither here nor there. What does this collect? So let's go ahead and talk about that because this collects... Green Lantern Core Recharge 1 through 5, Green Lantern Core 1 through 3, and then 7 through 38, Green Lantern 21 through 25, Green Lantern Sinestro Core Special Number 1, and then stories from Showcase 95, 7, and 8, Blackest Night Tales of the Core 1 through 3, and Untold Tales of Blackest Night Number 1. All right, so what does that mean? Uh, because I know a few of you have reached out to me about this and... It was solicited as collecting Green Lantern Core 1 through 38, but this isn't the first time that we've seen this happen. 100 Bullets was also solicited with Brother Lono Volume 2, and it didn't include it. So solicitation mistakes have happened in the past, you know, not just at DC, but also Marvel. And I understand the frustration with some people that are like, I can't believe they solicited and I pre-ordered it. I, I, I understand. Um, and you have every right, you know, to cancel your pre-order. I'm just going to go in ahead and, and say this, though, that those missing issues, they're not a deal breaker for me. Like, I think they would have been nice to have Dave Gibbons artwork in oversized format, but this book is just so damn worth it. Like, if you've not read the stories in here and you've seen, you know, people cancel their pre-orders or talking about how they're not going to order it. Yeah, maybe think twice. Maybe try to read it digitally and see what you think, because the stories in here sometimes surpass the stories of Green Lantern by Jeff Johns. And if you've followed my channel for a while, you know how highly I regard those particular stories. Oh my gosh, they're freaking awesome. But this, there are moments that I'm like, oh, this is so good. All right, so what is the story about then? Let, let's let's go in here and talk about Recharge. So Recharge was a miniseries, a five-issue miniseries written by Jeff Johns, who was writing at the time Green Lantern with Hal Jordan. And Dave Gibbons, of course, known for drawing Watchmen. I'm sure most people probably know him from that. But he was also a writer. And he co-wrote these particular miniseries, um, this one here, with Jeff Johns. We're introduced to a brand new Lantern. Oh, this is actually pretty funny because they keep going back between 1417 and then 1471. Um, that gets killed on his first day. And the Green Lanterns of Earth of Sector 2814 get summoned back to Oa which is where the Green Lanterns take place. So here we have Guy Gardner, and here we have Kyle Rayner, and we have Jon Stewart. But Jon uh, stays with the Justice League, and Hal Jordan stays on Earth. So it's just Kyle Rayner and, yes, Guy Gardner mooning on the moon. Very classic move there. And they're being summoned back to Oa. Now, the important thing about this is that this takes place after the events of Green Lantern Rebirth. And this is where he gets a little confusing, and, and I get it. It's never a stupid question to ask these things. Green Lantern Rebirth, the miniseries, the six-issue miniseries by Jeff Johns and Ethan Van Skyver. Not to be confused with Green Lantern Rebirth, the relaunch of the DC Universe that happened later on uh, with Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern. So that's a different thing. I'm talking about the 2005 miniseries. So this takes place immediately after that. And this is where we meet... Old friends and new friends. So this is Sora Nick Natu, who is in Sector 1417 in Koruga. And in this particular sector, people hate the Green Lantern Corps. They loathe them because of the things uh, that Sinestro had done in the past. They don't admire them like everybody else does. They're frowned upon. So it's a really cool thing to see her reject the ring. So why the... Two Green Lanterns from Earth have been summoned back to Oa is because the Guardians have decided to recharge the Green Lantern Corps. They've been gone for a while, and this is so cool, and there's so much history behind us that I really want to go into, uh, but it, I, gotta, I gotta keep on trucking. So, we are introduced to this young lady, Soranik Natu, again, rejecting the ring. She's a doctor, she's doing a surgery, and the ring kind of gets in the way, so later on, what she decides to do is take the ring and use it for her operation. And everybody's just looking at her like, what have you done? You just damned yourself. And then we meet a couple of characters. This is also during the Ran Thanagar War that leads into Infinite Crisis. So we have Ran and Thanagar at war with each other. And we meet a couple of 
characters from opposing sides. So we meet ba Vath right here. And Vath is being attacked by a bunch of Thanagarians. And Vath Sarn becomes a Green Lantern. And what he tries to do is kill the Thanagarians. But instead, the Green Lantern destroys... The, the ring destroys their weapons. Reminding people that, hey, Green Lanterns don't kill. Just because you have this power doesn't mean that you can use it any way you want to. Then we meet Isamoth Cole, who is in Ron and is about to get executed when the ring stops the execution. And why he's about to be executed is actually a really interesting thing about him. And you start sympathizing with him because of his decisions that he made. So we see these two Green Lanterns, these new recruits that are being chosen and they're at opposing odds. And it's so cool to see Kyle Rayner come back up to Oa because it's so different from him. Because for the longest time, he was the only Green Lantern. The reason there was a huge resurrection was because of him. And that's why the Guardians love him. Uh, there's Brick right there. So you see a lot of returning characters. You see uh, Boudica. You see, actually, you see the return of the Lost, or what will be known as the Lost Lantern. So it's not... Not just Booty Cub, but it's Hanu and Lyra and Keenan, those kind of characters uh, that feel betrayed by Hal Jordan and actually appear in the pages of Green Lantern by Jeff Johns. But they're all being led by Kilowog here, who's introducing the new recruits. And he pretty much tells Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner that they're going to be training these new recruits. Soranek's like, I don't want any of this. Take your stupid ring and keep it. And that's really interesting because I don't think the Green Lanterns have had that happen. They're like, what are you talking about? There's only three ways to get out of this. Failure, death, or both of the above is the only way to get out of being a Green Lantern. But she doesn't want it. So Salak right here, he's the keeper of the Book of Oa. So he's kind of like the in-between the Green Lantern Corps and the Guardians because nobody really goes to see the Guardians. Of course, that's about... Uh, to be proven wrong because Guy Gardner's pissed that he is nothing but a trainer. He's like, what are you guys doing, man? Do you know who I am? I'm freaking Guy Gardner. And I love the way they treat Guy Gardner and the way they treat Kyle. Like, they see Kyle as the torchbearer, the one that gave us new life. And so he's almost like this favorite child and Guy Gardner's like this idiot. And, and... I will say he's a little different than the 90s guy. You know, 90s guy was kind of a prick. And for no reasons at times. I mean, yeah, though there was a lot of heart to his stories, though. I, I, I did enjoy Guy Gardner, uh, the, the ongoing series, and then the Guy Gardner Warrior series. But here he's been he's been rewritten a little different. And I kind of like the way they, they're doing it. There's this amazing scene right here between Kilowog and Guy. Because Kilowog stops him from leaving, and he's like, look, I need you. Somebody needs to train these new recruits. It's got to be you and Kyle. We need experts out there because the universe is about to change. And they see a bunch of Green Lantern rings just go out and start recruiting people from different sectors across the universe. And it's so awesome. So what the first miniseries does, I can't believe I haven't even talked about what this is. Is it introduces us to the notion that there's different sectors across the galaxies. Uh, but also within the sector, there's point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3. So three or four people can be assigned to the same sector. And the Green Lantern core is just growing and growing. And I think by the end of it, it's like 7,200. There's Green Man. I love that guy in Steel or Stell, rather. So through the eyes of these rookies, we're introduced to this bigger world of the Green Lantern core. Like the rookies can't use their ring against yellow until they get to level one. So outside of training. And there's also a change of heart, of course. Sorenik Natu finds out exactly what it means to be a Green Lantern. That there is some good in them. That they can help people out. And this all has to do with the Spider Guild trying to destroy not just Oa, but also Earth. Even though DC Forever tries to embed that Oa is the center of the universe. Really, come on. How many things happen on Earth? But I still love that about... Uh, the Green Lantern mythos that they're like, no, no, it's Oa. It's always been Oa. And one of the things that I loved about this series immediately was the character development. Not just the chemistry between Soranik and um, Kyle, 
But just like these two Ran, Thanagar, uh, Ran and Thanagar characters that hate each other, but they have to put their differences aside because the will of the core is what matters. Nothing else matters. Like, it doesn't matter if you're at war with each other. What matters is saving the universe. Uh, we do have the return of a couple of other characters through here, like Fatality, which was a villain from Kyle Rayner's run. So people that have been reading Green Lantern for a while will enjoy a lot of these Easter eggs. All right. So by the end of the miniseries, Sorenik decides to stay. We have a brand new recruits that are now, they've been promoted to level one Green Lanterns. And then we get the ongoing series. Now, Jeff Johns co-wrote that with Dave Gibbons, but Dave Gibbons kicks off the ongoing series. And you probably noticed that the art was by Patrick Gleason. So the first story arc is a murder mystery, and we're introduced to a couple of new Green Lanterns, uh, new recruits, like, uh, oh, what is this? The, the little fly guy. I love that guy. Is it buzzed? Uh, something ridiculous like that. Uh, we're also introduced to the princess, Yolande. I really like that character. She's had a conflict. But there's all kinds of different characters that appear through here. And that's what I enjoy about the Green Lantern Corps book. Is that it could be a little bug. It could be a plant. It could be a princess. The ring chooses whoever has the strongest will. Whoever doesn't give in to fear. Now, what's really interesting about this, though, is that it doesn't collect those missing issues by Dave Gibbons, right? It doesn't collect issues... Uh, four, five, and six. But it does collect the lead up to it, which is the Dave Gibbons. And, and those stories are just Guy Gardner. That's all they are. They are collected in the To Be a Lantern trade paperback. Yeah, it's these stories right here. It's Guy Gardner on vacation. That's all it is. It would have been cool to see Dave Gibbons' art in oversized format. But again, it's. In the long scheme of things, is it really necessary? Uh, no, I mean, it's not going to take away from the experience. So the Dark Side of Green comes out. Keep in mind that during this time, we also have Jeff John's Green Lantern book going. And that's all building up to the big story arc that is going to happen, which is the first crossover between Green Lantern and Green Lantern Corps, and that is the Sinestro Corps War. So these few issues are introducing new, us to new Green Lantern Corps members like Saddam Yacht the, uh, from Daxam, the Daxamite. And actually, Keith Champagne does a couple of fill-in uh, issues here with Guy Gardner, uh, where he's kind of framed for murder. And those are pretty cool. Uh, in a, it's only like a three-issue arc before Dave Gibbons comes back. So you're probably wondering, wait a minute, so if this is a Patrick Gleason and Peter Tomasi omnibus... When does Patrick Gleason get involved in this? There's Buzz. That guy's so cool. Um, all right. So, believe it or not, Peter Tomasi was an editor. So, even through the early stages of the Green Lantern books, Peter Tomasi was the editor of the Green Lantern Corps. And then he took a step back to start writing the book in the middle of the Sinestro Corps War. And oh my gosh... I could just talk about this one for a long time, but Sinestro Corps War is one of my favorite crossovers. It is the story of how Sinestro ends up getting his own core. So we've had the Green Lantern Corps, and now we have the introduction of the Yellow Lanterns. And they have their own oath, and the rings, the Yellow Lantern rings, are now recruiting people out there throughout the universe. Kind of like the Green Lantern rings recruit members to the Green Lantern Corps created by the Guardians. This time, though, it's nothing but Yellow Lantern rings going across the galaxy and bringing fear into people. And the rings themselves are killing people. Kyle gets kidnapped. Oh, man, poor Kyle. And when it ends up happening to him. And the core is growing. So now the Green Lanterns, who, you know, depending on what... Silver Age, Golden Age, uh, they, have this, they couldn't do anything about around Yellow, and the recruits couldn't do anything around Yellow, have to fight a Yellow Lantern Corps. And like even the rings, like I said, are killing people. And the Green Lanterns can't kill anybody. They're like the police force. So we have to have change, and the Guardians know this, and they have this fear of what's to come if they unlock this ability in the Green Lantern Corps. It is a 10-part crossover that is just so badass, and... There are some members of the teams of the Green Lantern Corps that end up dying 
And, you know, some, some of them that I was like, oh man, I was hoping to see more and more. And this is mapped perfectly. And it, it helps that, you know, it's like part one, part two, part three. So you know what to read next. Uh, but the things that happen in here, the characters that show up through here. And yes, I was really upset when they killed a particular character. I was like, oh, come on. Uh, we have introductions of new characters too. So not only do we have an introduction of all these Green Lantern Corps members, but we also have now the Yellow Lanterns like Akio or uh, Lisa, uh, what is her name? Lisa Drac, I think. Yeah, that this crazy lady. There's a crazy Green Lantern Corps member. That's this mother that captures babies inside of her bony ribs. Her name is Crib. Oh my gosh, just the designs. Patrick Gleason had a blast. And the ending to the Green Lantern, or the Sinestro Corps War, is one of my favorite endings to any event. Like, the way that it ends, I was like, yes, that's how you write a superhero story. I freaking love it. And if you've not read it, you need to do yourself a favor and read it. There's amazing spread pages like this. Now, the one shot that kicks it off is drawn by Ethan Van Skyver. Ivan Reyes draws the internal artwork of the Green Lantern book, the Hal Jordan book. And then, of course, Patrick Gleason draws the Green Lantern core book. And the aftermath is... One of my favorite things is that Kyle and Guy decide to open up a bar to kind of make it more like Earth and Oa. Ice returns, and that happened in the pages of Green Lantern. So, you know, it's almost like you have to read both stories. Now, I will say one thing. Uh, there is some double dipping, of course, uh, because whenever you're talking about the Sinestro Corps War, that was already collected in the pages of Green Lantern by Jeff Johns. So this has that those 10, 10 part crossover. So that's already in the Green Lantern Omnibus by Jeff Johns. Uh, but also the the Green Lantern re, uh, recharge is in there too, the five issue miniseries. So you're looking at about 16 issues of double dipping. Now there are some things that I wish had been collected in here that were not in the Jeff Johns Green Lantern Omnibus Volume 1. Uh, and that is the one shots of Tales of the Sinestro Corps. I know the Tales of the Sinestro Corps Superman Prime one shot is in the Omnibus, but I wish it had collected the Parallax one shot the Cyborg Superman one-shot, and the Ion one-shot. I wish those uh, these particular one-shots were collected in here. Just to kind of have everything. And I know that Patrick Gleason nor Peter Tomasi did anything with those books, but I kind of wish that uh, they had been. And what happens after the Sinestro Corps? Well, the Yellow Rings are still out there trying to recruit new characters. So, who ends up with one, but by force, because he ends up killing one of the Yellow Lanterns, and that is Mongol. So, this is Mongol 2, Son of Mongol, or Mongol 2, the sequel. This is the showcase stories written by Peter Tomasi. Now, the scans are, on these are a lot different than the scans here. And same thing happens in Marvel Comics. It's just this weird era of the 90s when we started using these computer-generated colors that they have the hardest time cleaning up. We're going to have to have like some kind of Masterworks touch-up on these particular books. I was hoping they touch it up, but yeah. So they look a little muddled, a little blurry. It's just for two issues. Uh, you know, it doesn't really take away from uh, the rest of the omnibus. But yeah, Ring Quest kicks off the idea of like, look, there's other yellow lanterns that could be recruited so it's up to the green lanterns to stop them we have the alpha lantern storyline here uh mongol coming in with the black mercy but something else is behind the black mercy and i really like where that story ends there's Arisia, so she comes back into the book and plays a bigger part actually she keeps an eye on so damn yet that's kind of where the guardians left her now after the yellow lantern fight the big sinestro core war this is uh crib i believe yeah this is the character I was talking about. There's an idea that perhaps there's more color lanterns out there. There's more to the color spectrum. So it might not just stop at yellow. There could be perhaps red. There could be indigo or there could be blue. And of course, the idea leads into whatever the blackest night is. If you've not read it, you're in for a freaking treat. Now, that's all I will say about this. I think I've talked enough about this book. I uh, I really hope I did it justice because it's one of my favorite 
stories that DC told, and it makes me miss that era when Green Lantern was so big that we had a Green Lantern core book, we had like a New Guardians book, Sinestro had his own book, Larfreeze had his own book, the Red Lanterns had their own book, I mean, it was just Green Lantern craze everywhere, now I think it's back to just one title, maybe, who knows, maybe, you know, just like everything else in comics, it comes and goes. Uh, now, the book is solicited at having 1,616 pages. It doesn't. It has... Actually, let's look at what the extras are. It's the script to Green Lantern Corps number 33. Um, but the book has 1,272 pages. And retails for $150. Let's look at the binding. So again, 1,272 pages. It is sewn binding. This is what the eye looks like. Um, we've seen bigger. We've also seen smaller eyes. Even though we are given a table of contents telling you where you're going to find each issue, there are no page numbers throughout the book. And I understand it when it's, you know, the full bleed, but when you have pages like this, this is what these are for, so I was hoping. Um, so, you know, if you're a stickler for wanting to know what issue you're on, they also don't put the issue number in the back. Uh, you may kind of have to eye it. like Because uh, I know some people like to know what issue they're on. That's why they have issues with, like, the... Uh, Jonathan Hickman books, but there are no page numbers throughout here. Uh, the paper stock in this seems a little thinner than usual for DC. It reminds me, honestly, of the Batman by Peter Tomasi omnibus. So there is a little bit of bleed through coming from the opposite pages. Whenever it's light or, or white, but I did want to point that out. There is some gutter loss. Very minor gutter loss, though. Now, if you're worried about no variant covers, the variant covers, if they have it, are on the opposite side of the standard edition covers. So they are there. Uh, they're just not kept as extras. And after all these years, Kyle Rayner's still my favorite Green Lantern. That, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this omnibus, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answer within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for Omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this book. Let me know in the comments down below if you are picking this up, if you already have them in trade paperback and hardcover edition, if you don't feel like double dipping any with the Jeff Johns Green Lantern Omnibus, and, of course, who is your favorite lantern? For me, I think it will always be Kyle. Big fan of Kyle, so I was glad that he took a little bit of a spotlight on this uh, particular series, but along with all the other core members. But I would love to know who your favorite Green Lantern is. Leave those comments down below. Smash that like button. Subscribe and ring that bell for notifications. Check out our Patreon and Spread Shop Amazing Ways to support the channel. If you can do so, everyone stay healthy and safe out there. In brightest day, in blackest night, much love. It's the only way I could end it. <laughs>